My goodness, so you're six. I remember when I was six, I learned a little poem which I promised I would say every morning because I knew that being six was the most important thing there was. Shall I tell you my poem? Yes? Very well. When I was one, I had just begun. When I was two, I was nearly new. When I was three, I was hardly me. When I was four, I was not much more. When I was five, I was just alive. But now I am six, I'm as clever as clever. So I think I'll be six now forever and ever. Oh dear, it was such a pity I didn't say it every morning because I might have stayed six forever and I'm sure that would have been grand. But some mornings I felt like singing and when I felt like singing, I would sing this song. There were two little bears who lived in a wood. One of them was bad and the other was good. Good bear learnt his twice times one, and bad bear left all his buttons undone. They lived in a tree when the weather was hot. One of them was good and the other was not. Good bear learnt his twice times two, and bad bear's thingamies were worn right through. They lived in a cave when the weather was cold. And they did, or they didn't do, what they were told. Good bear learnt his twice times three, and bad bear never had his handkerchief. They lived in a wood with a kind old aunt, and one said yes, and the other said shan't. Good bear learnt his twice times four, and bad bear's nicoties were terrible tall. And then quite suddenly, just like us, one got better and the other got was Good bear muddled his twice times three, and bad bear coughed in his handkerchief. Good bear muddled his twice times two, and bad bear's thingamies look like you. Good bear muddled his twice times one, and bad bear never left his buttons undone. There may be a moral, though some say not. I think there's a moral, though I don't know what. But if one gets better as the other gets worse, these two little bears are just like us. For Christopher loves his twice times ten. And I never know where I put my pen. So I shall have to write the next one in pencil. Do you like arithmetic? When I was six, I could never be sure but I once had an arithmetic thought, and it went like this. If I were John and John were me, then he'd be six and I'd be three. If John were me and I were John, I shouldn't have these trousers on. How old was my brother John? Did you say three? Well, you were quite right. Now, while we're talking about arithmetic, I'd like to tell you about an emperor who had a rhyme which was all about arithmetic. I'm not sure I know what it was all about, but I do know it was a very good rhyme. I will sing it to you. The king of Peru, who was emperor too, had a sort of a rhyme which was useful to know. If he felt very shy when a stranger came by, or they asked him the time when his watch didn't go. Or supposing he fell by mistake down a well Or he tumbled when skating and sat on his hat Or perhaps wasn't told till his porridge was cold That his breakfast was waiting or something like that Oh, whenever the emperor got in the temper Or felt himself sulky or sad He would murmur and murmur until he felt firmer This curious rhyme which he had Eight, eight's a sixty-four, multiply by seven. When it's done, carry one and take away eleven. Nine, nine's are eighty-one, multiply by three. If it's more, carry four, and then it's time for tea. So whenever the queen took his armor to clean And she didn't remember to use any starch Or his birthday in May was a horrible day Being wet as November and windy as March Or of sitting in state with the wise and the great He just happened to pick up while signing his name Or the queen gave a cough when his crown tumbled off As he bent down to pick up a pen for the same 
whenever the emperor got in a temper or felt himself awkward and shy. He would whisper and whisper until he felt crisper this odd little rhyme to the sky. Eight eights are eighty-one, multiply by seven, and if it's more, carry four and oh. Take away eleven. Nine nines are sixty-four. Multiply by three. When it's done, carry one, and then it's time for tea. How about a nice cup of tea? Hmm? You know, it's funny how arithmetic seems to come into everything. It may not make us feel better, like the emperor, of course, but it is very important. Even Pooh Bear, who isn't six, tries to do arithmetic. Sometimes we talk about it together, as we do in this song, which I call the Friend. There are lots and lots of people who are always asking things, like dates and pound and ounces, and the names of funny kings. And the answer's either sixpence or a hundred inches long. And I know they'll think me silly if I get the answer wrong, the answer wrong. So Pooh and I go whispering, and Pooh looks very bright, and says, well, I say sixpence, but I don't suppose I'm right. And then it doesn't matter what the answer ought to be. Cause if he's right, I'm right, and if he's wrong, it isn't me. If he's wrong, it isn't me. What do you think about the weather? Grown-ups always talk about it, so why shouldn't we? I must say I like watching the weather change, but it does make a difference to what we do. There was one morning when I went once, and then again, and everyone said I mustn't go out in the weather. I'll tell you what happened. Christopher Robin had weasels and sneasels. They bundled him into his bed. They gave him what goes with a cold in the nose and some more for a cold in the head. They wondered if weasels could turn into measles, if sneezels would turn into mumps. They examined his chest for a rash and the rest of his body for swelling and lumps. They sent for some doctors in sneezels and weasels to tell them what ought to be done. All sorts of conditions of famous physicians come hurrying round at a run. They all made a note of the state of his throat. They asked if he suffered from thirst. They asked if the sneezels came after the weasels or if to the first sneasel came first. They said if you teasel, a sneasel, a weasel, a measel may easily grow. But humor or pleasel, the weasel or sneasel, the measel will certainly go. They expounded the reasons for sneasels and weasels, the appearance of measles when new. They said if you freezel in drafts and in breezels, then sneasels may even ensue. Christopher Robin got up in the morning, the sneezels had vanished away. And the look in his eyes seemed to say to the sky, Now how to amuse them today? Achoo! That will give them something to think about. When all the doctors had gone, I discovered a poem about the weather. Actually, it is about the wind, but the wind blows all the weather along to us, so it's really the same thing. But no one can tell me, nobody knows, where the wind comes from, where the wind goes. It's flying from somewhere as fast as it can. I couldn't keep up with it, not if I ran. But if I stopped holding the string of my kite, it would blow with the wind for a day and a night. And then when I found it, wherever it blew, I should know that the wind had been going there too. So then I could tell them where the wind goes, but where the wind comes from, nobody knows. It seems to me that the weather must be almost as important as arithmetic. I once heard all about a brave knight who wouldn't go out in the rain because it made his armor squeak. He knew how to stop it squeaking, of course, but he still didn't like the wet. But I think I'd better begin at the beginning because it's quite a long story. Of all the knights in Appledore, the wisest was Sir Thomas Tom. He multiplied as far as four, 
and knew what nine was taken from to make eleven. He could write a letter to another knight. No other knight in all the land could do the things which he could do. Not only did he understand the way to polish swords, but knew what remedy a knight should seek whose armour had begun to squeak. And if he didn't fight too much, it wasn't that he did not care for blips and buffetings and such, but felt that it was hardly fair to risk by frequent injuries a brain as delicate as his. His castle, Castle Tom, was set conveniently on a hill. And daily, when it wasn't wet, he paced the battlements until some smaller knight who couldn't swim should reach the moat and challenge him. Or sometimes feeling full of fight, he hurried out to scour the plain, and seeing some approaching knight, he either hurried home again, or hid, and when the foe was past, blew a triumphant trumpet blast. One day, when good Sir Thomas Tom was resting in a handy ditch, the noises he was hiding from, though very much the noises which he'd always hidden from before, seemed somehow less. Or was it more? The trotting horse, the trumpet's blast, the whistling sword, the armour's squeak, these, and especially the last, had clattered by him all the week. Was this the same, or was it not? Something was different. But what? Sir Thomas raised a cautious ear and listened as Sir Hugh went by, and suddenly he seemed to hear, or not to hear, the reason why this stranger made a nicer sound than other knights who lived around. Sir Thomas watched the way he went. His rage was such he couldn't speak. For years they'd called him down in Kent the knight whose armour didn't squeak. Yet here and now he looked upon another knight whose squeak had gone. He rushed where his horse was tied, he spurred it to a rapid trot. The only fear he felt inside about his enemy was not how sharp his sword, how stout his heart, but has he got too long a start? Sir Hugh was singing hand on hip when something sudden came along and caught him a terrific blip right in the middle of his song. A thunderstorm, he thought, of course, and toppled gently off his horse. Then, said the good Sir Thomas Tom, dismounting with a friendly air, allow me to extract you from the heavy armour that you wear. At times like these, the bravest knight may find his armour much too tight. A hundred yards or so beyond the scene of brave Sir Hugh's defeat, Sir Thomas found a useful pond, and careful not to wet his feet, he brought the armour to the brink and flung it in, and watched it sink. So ever after, more and more, the men of Kent would proudly speak of Thomas Tom of Appledore, the knight whose armour didn't squeak, whilst you, the knight who gave him best, squeaks just as badly as the rest. We started off with the weather. I think we'd better finish with it. But oh, those frosty mornings when it nips at your ears and your nose. That's when I wish I could be a furry bear. <laughs> If I were a bear and a big bear too I shouldn't much care if it froze or snew I shouldn't much mind if it snowed or frizz I'd be overlined with a coat like his For I'd have fur boots and a big brown wrap and brown fur knickers and a big fur cap I'd have a fur muffler rough to cover my jaws and brown fur mittens on my big brown paws with a big brown furry down up to my head I'd sleep all the winter I'd sleep all the winter in a big fur 